first time we're in this room, so how do you like it? <laughs> okay, mixed response. Um, Abhinav Kumar is a mathematician working with enterprise technologies, which is a well-known head group. So uh, he achieved a silver and gold medal for the easiest human in the IMO. And he's also ranked for uh, 125,000 students on the IIT entrance exam. And in fact, he chose to go to MIT. Um, he is a triple major at MIT and a three-time William Lowell Topping Fellow and winner of the undergraduate academic award in both math and physics. So after completing his PhD um, at Harvard, he returned to MIT as a faculty member and in particular as an instructor at the MIT Hubman Seminar for mathematical problem solving. So since uh, 2014, he's been in the finance industry but he's also been doing fundamental research at Stony Brook. And uh, in fact, he's part of the team that solved a sphere packing problem in 24 dimensions. Uh, a few weeks after the solution was achieved for eight dimensions. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Abhinav and uh, let him get started. Hey, thank you very much. Thanks to the, for the invitation to Pacing, Kuwan. Uh, and thank you for coming. So. Uh, this is meant to be, I mean, as all Math Circle talks are, more of a conversation and uh, rather than a lecture. So please feel free to stop me at any point if there's something that you, you know, don't understand or not following or seems absurd or is just wrong. So <laughs> uh, I'm happy to, to spend more time on, on stuff. Uh, and um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, for the invitation to facing Kuhn. Um, and thank you for coming. So um, oh, this is meant to be, I mean, as all <laughs> math circle <laughs> talks. All right, I guess I'm going to be following my session yeah. and uh, rather than a lecture. So please feel free to stop me at any point. <laughs> There's something Should that you turn know. that off. Some don't understand or not following. Is like or an seems absurd. Or or it's wrong. Or like so ten, you know, uh, thirty second delay. I'm happy to <laughs> more time wow. on stuff. Uh, <laughs> and um, I wanted. So I want to talk a little bit about this like very uh, elementary problem, uh, or elementary to state, but very hard to solve uh, problem, which is very easy to sort of get into, uh, you know, just start playing with this problem. So let's talk about sphere packing. Okay, is this uh, legible? Can people see this? You want me to write bigger? Let me know if. Is it, is it a little harder to see? Okay. Well, this one I, uh, I'll leave it as it is, but I'm going to try to write bigger. Um, okay. So, right. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about what the basic question is. So the basic question is the following: You. So it really should be called uh, packing balls rather than packing spheres. Technically, when, when we talk about a sphere in some dimension, uh, we me mean the surface of the ball. Uh, and here we're really talking about the whole volume, the, the filled-in sphere. Okay, so it's really packing balls. But uh, historically, this has been called sphere packing, so we're going to stick with that. Okay? So uh, the idea is you want to arrange, so you want to arrange balls of equal size <coughs> with no overlap in n-dimensional space. And the goal is to fill the maximum possible uh, fraction of space. Okay, so to fill maximum fraction space possible. So that's the, that's the goal. Um, <coughs> and n is the dimension of our, our space in which we live in. Uh, so you can, n can be one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional, whichever space or higher, uh, whatever we're considering. And you have 
uh, balls of equal size, uh, infinitely many of them. So let's suppose that they have all have radius 1. You want to pack them together, but they can't overlap each, with each other, except they're allowed to touch. Okay, so that much I'll allow. Uh, and you want to uh, maximize, you want to cram them as, as well as possible. Okay, so fill as much, to get as much density uh, as possible covered by that fraction of balls. So let's jump in and do an example, because that's the easiest way to see what's going on. Uh, Wait, is, is this big enough? Is this OK? Everybody can see? All right, so in one dimensional space, uh, this is a relatively easy problem. So what's a ball is just an interval. Right, so it's all the points. So you're on the real line, and it's all the points that are, let's say, distance at most one from the central point. So here's my central point. And I'm just looking at everything that's distance at most 1, and that gives me an interval. So if this point was 0, then I'm just looking at the interval minus 1 to 1. OK? So far, so good? So that's a ball. And we have infinitely many of these intervals. And you want to put them together uh, without overlap. So you have, you, know, you have an infinite supply of these intervals. And you want to cram them as, as well as possible. So how would you do it? Yep. That doesn't matter if they're touching. So what, what would you like to do with them? Right. So you, you align them. So you put the right end point here and the left end point here and so on. So you just you get 0 to 1, 1 to 3, uh, and so on. And, and you can pack the entire line, and you get density 1, which is the best you can do anyway. So far, so good? So, uh, so this is an easy one. Okay? So this is the best you can do, clearly, and you can do it. Okay? You cannot do better than density 1, and we just got it in dimension 1. So one dimension is, is easy. Uh, so let's go to two dimensions, where it will get infinitely harder, because it's 0 difficulty here, and it's going to be finite difficulty here. Two dimensions. So what do we do? So here a ball is a disk. Okay, so we want to pack space by infinitely many copies of these disks, but they cannot overlap, right? So you cannot have this is not allowed. This is bad. But they're allowed to. But they're allowed to touch. Okay, so this is not allowed. But, for instance, this is allowed. Okay. All right. So, what do we do? Uh, what's the best way to to arrange disks on the plane? to maximize the density. So if you start playing around with this, I, I don't know if people have played with, uh, you know, you take a bunch of quarters and you try arranging them. Uh, very soon you will you'll see that you can place six quarters around a central one, like this. And then you can keep going. That's the best one. That's the best part of this, is this pattern you can extend basically to infinity. If I draw it correctly, at least. <laughs> OK. So that, that's what that looks like. Uh, is everyone OK with this? Right? So uh, if you look at, you look at the centers of, of these disks, you see that they form this nice triangular pattern. I'm going to draw it for you. So 
So it's very nice. It's pretty. These are all equilateral triangles. And if you look at uh, any one uh, particular disk uh, or center, there's a hexagon around it. And this classically, historically, this is called the hexagonal hexagonal packing. So this is called the Uh, so this this appears to be the best we can do if you start arranging things. Uh, for instance, you can work out that it's it leaves less space than than the square packing, which is also a standard thing you might try. So this is better than. This is the square packing. Right, but but that's not a proof that it's the best. Okay, it just appears to be the best you can do with uh, trying to cram in as many coins into space as you can. Right, so that's pattern extends infinitely off, infinitely far, and and that's that's what you get. So this is called the hexagonal packing, and I'll get to um, I'll I'll talk in a little bit about how you actually prove that this is the best. So that that takes some work. Okay. So far, so good. Uh, everybody happy with one and two dimensions? So you see, one dimension was very easy. We came up with a guess. And very quickly, we realized that the, you could do as well as you could possibly do with this guess, namely density 1. Because here, you can't get density 1. So it's not completely clear that this guess is the correct guess. Right? So, so this is non-trivial. Um, and then three dimensions gets even harder. Uh, <coughs> right. So this is uh, what you're trying to do if you're trying to stack oranges. So, so in some sense, green grocers have known the problem, known the answer to this problem for for several centuries, uh, maybe even millennia. But uh, <laughs> but the way you can do it is you take. You take the, the two-dimensional uh, layer. So instead of thinking of these as coins, you can think of these as oranges or, or three-dimensional balls. And uh, they're arranged in a, in a, in a flat layer. Okay? And then you can put another layer of the same type on top of this one. Okay? So let me go back to this picture and talk about where you might, you might be able to, to put a layer. So if you, have, if you think of these as as balls, as three-dimensional balls, here is an ideal place to put another ball on top. Right? There's a, there's a hole in here. Um, it won't fit another another ball, but you can put one on, on the second layer. Okay. So here's an example. So you, the second ball might might be able to place it here. Does that make sense? Uh, and you see that there are many many of these these holes. So I'm going to draw them in two colors. Uh, So here's how do I get these two? Oh, push the end. Oh. Oh. And this stays there. Oh. So you see that. Some of these holes also form uh, equilateral triangles of the same size. And so if you decided to put the next layer on top of these green dots, then you would get another packing which was exactly like this one, but, but shifted over okay, in the second layer. Uh, and then there's a third, but I've left out a bunch of holes, namely these ones. Uh, and these form a third, third version of the, of the hexagonal packing. So this is what you do for, for three dimensions. You take, you stack 
hexagonal layers uh, on top of each other. So does that make sense? OK. So stack. So if I call the original layer A, that arrangement, that positioning is A. So then there are two classes of holes. So there is so holes are of two types, B and let's call them B and C. And so if your first layer is A, the second layer could be B or C. The layer above it. I could choose to be B, and the layer below it, I could choose to be something else. I could choose to be B or C. Doesn't matter. So B or C. And again, the next one above this cannot be B, but it can be A or C. So if you keep doing this, you see that at any point you have two choices um, for the for the next layer. So in fact, there are infinitely many ways of doing this, but. Uh, and they all have equal density. But one in particular, so if you choose if you choose A, B, C, A, B, C, this is what's called the this is a it's called the face centered cubic arrangement. Or packing. And it's the it's the crystal structure of that you see in salt, for instance. So sodium chloride has has this crystal structure the atoms of sodium would be in would be in a face centered arrangement uh, and so that's one example and and this is this again is, is a conjecture this is the best that you seem to be able to do but uh, but we didn't know for a long time that this was the this was the actual answer so <coughs> since i said it's face centered i'll just tell you one more way to see it which is not by stacking, but by, by doing something like this. So another way to see. To see face centered cubic uh, is, well, you make the cubic grid in three dimensions. So And what you do is you put po you put the centers of the spheres at the at the centers of the faces here. So that's why it's called face centered. So you ch so any cube has six faces, and you would put you know you would put a point in the you take a point in the middle of that face, and so here here and so on. Uh, and if you take all the centers of the cubes, uh, all the face centers of the cubes, then this gives you the centers uh, at which to put your spheres. So centers. Faces of cubic, cubic crystal so leads to FCC packing. So that's another way to, to see this uh, <coughs> this particular packing, which is the way that you know chemists would would study uh, sodium chloride and so on. Okay, so this is uh, this was a conjecture for a long time, uh, and so was this. Uh, this was believed to be true, uh, but uh, <coughs> let me just say. So Kepler in 1611 uh, conjectured this is the best. This is densest. So as you know. Four, four centuries ago, he con conjectured this. Uh, <coughs> and what about what about actual proofs? So, So the first 
rigorous proof for even just two dimensions. Uh, can anybody guess when the proof was given? So it was only 1940. I mean, people tried before then, but but there were there were false proofs before then. Uh, so this was a Hungarian mathematician, Feyerstock. And uh, for 3D, and so this is um, maybe a page or two. It's, it's not very, it's not a very complicated proof, but it's a, but writing down a rigorous proof requires some effort. Uh, for three dimensions, it requires a lot more effort. Uh, so this was done in about 20 years ago, 1998. This was by Tom Hales and his collaborators. And they used a ton of computer calculation uh, to be able to do this. So, so at, at that point, I think there were several newspaper articles talking about either this computer proof. Uh, and people weren't sure whether you know they believed it because it was long, and I think the figure was something like maybe it took uh, eight gigabytes or something, which now nowadays seems not that big. Uh, but anyway, there was lots and lots of computer data that had to be processed in order to be able to to verify that that this is the densest packing. And uh, the story goes that they then then tried to publish this, and it was published in the in the you know top journal. Uh, and there was a team of referees that, that tried to, to judge whether this paper was correct or not. Uh, after about a year, they gave up. And <laughs> they just published it anyway. Uh, so Hales got frustrated by this whole process, because it involved so much computer calculation, nobody was willing to sort of go through it. Uh, so what he did was he launched a project called the FlySpec project to uh, verify this by automated theorem proving. So by you know, to have a more formal way to uh, prove uh, completely rigorously without any human intervention that uh, that he really had the right theorem, and that that was just finished uh, just a, I think a few months ago. <coughs> so, so now people really fully believe this. So, this is verified. By, so, what's called the FlySpec project. So this one turns out to be, you know, the proof for, for three dimensions. Uh, it's easy to write down the the conjecture, but the proof is, is pretty hard. Um, all right. So so that's three dimensions. It's what happens beyond. And beyond. So we have some guesses. But uh, till last year, we didn't have any proofs. So, um, but sort of no proven answers. So what happened last year was uh, <coughs> Marina Biazovska, uh, so a Ukrainian mathematician, uh, gave a gave a really beautiful, stunningly elegant, and short proof in eight dimensions of the answer. Answer, which I haven't, I haven't told you yet what the answer is. Eighty. Okay, and uh, and then we followed this up. Uh, so and then uh, 
So I was one of the five people who did this. Uh, Miller. Chenko and Litovska. We solved this in, in 24 dimensions as well. Okay, so at this point, you should be wondering the following: uh, <laughs> What is first of all? What are the answers in eight and 24 dimensions? Uh, what are these packings? Uh, why did we jump from three dimensions to eight and 24? What happened to four through seven? Uh, and then why did we make another jump you know, from 8 to 24? Right. So. <laughs> Let me let this be. Sorry, question. Yes? Yes. Um, I think, Oops. could you say something about what word dimensions to the mean? So I have a feeling that some Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. No so one way to think about four dimensions is, well, the way that that is typically uh, thought of by scientists or physicists is you can think of time as your fourth dimension. Uh, so you have a three dimension of space and, four, and a fourth dimension of time. Uh, now, that's one way to think about it. So you can think of you know, an extra, uh, just like you go from two dimensions to three dimensions, you can think of going from three dimensions to four dimensions. Uh, now, there are more sort of algebraic ways to think about it, which I tend to prefer. So I think of four dimensions. I mean, I tend to think of think of it as uh, you know, as a, well, you can think of it as a four-dimensional product of of the real line. So you can you can think of it as being parameterized by four four real numbers instead of um, you know typically when we think of three dimensions, we have three real numbers. Uh, namely the x coordinate the y coordinate and the z coordinate and you can instead think of uh, four dimensions you have one more coordinate which which tells you where you are in four dimensional space so the x coordinate the y coordinate the z coordinate and the w coordinate or the t coordinate so to speak does that make sense right so it's it's a it's an extension it's kind of hard to visualize uh, I mean, there are, there've been some mathematicians who have been able to visualize four dimensions four dimensions easily i'm not one of them but uh, is that is that reasonable? Should I try say something else? Yeah. So you can think of this as, you know, <coughs> so. And then how about a, a sphere? Yes. Thank you. That's that's a great question. Yeah. So what's a what's a sphere and what's a sphere? In 4D, or in n dimensions for that matter. Yes. Right, you can think of right. This is that's a good way to think about it. So, just like in, in three dimensions, when you think of, uh, let me draw an analogous picture. So, if you take a three-dimensional ball <coughs> and you and you cut it into cross sections, uh, <coughs> you see that you know at the equator you're going to get a disk that's that's the largest possible diameter, and then if you if you get closer to the poles, you'll get Smaller possible, smaller disks, and so on. So you can you can think of a, a three-dimensional ball as layers of of disks uh, arranged, you know, which get smaller as you get towards the poles. And and the same sort of picture holds in in four dimensions. You can think of you know cross sectioning it, uh, and so you get you can think of having cross sections which are three-dimensional balls, uh, which get smaller and smaller as you get towards the poles. So that's one way to think about it. Uh, and geometrically, I think that's a that's a nice way to to go about it. Uh, Another way to just say what a sphere is in, in n dimensions, um, you know, to, to write it down, you could say that it's all the, so the set of the ball. So this is what I really wanted to find is, is all the points at distance 
less than or equal to some number, let's say one, if you're talking about a unit ball uh, from some from the center. Right? So if you're talking about talking about the origin, it's all the all the points which are a distance at most one from the origin. Uh, and this works in two dimensions, it works in one dimension, it works in three dimensions, it works in four dimensions. And and algebraically you could write this down in terms of four coordinates as saying, well the distance of let's say my center if the center is the origin then uh, <coughs> let me write it here then the ball is consists of all points x, y, z, w such that I use t, so let me let me use t such that its distance is at, from the origin is at most one. So namely, you know, its distance is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus t squared, and you want that to be at most one. In other words, you can square both sides and this is the same as saying x squared plus mm -hmm. y squared plus z squared plus t squared less than equal to 1. Does that make sense? So, and, and this tells you basically how to look at it in n dimensions. You, whatever your n coordinates are, the sum of their squares are at most 1. So that's a unit ball in, in n dimensions. And uh, this is the square of your radius. If your radius was 2 or something like that, you would put the square of that number in there. And that would give you an n dimensional ball. Right, so if you if you take a cross section, what does that correspond to? That corresponds to saying I'm going to send the last coordinate to some number, and what does that do to the to the cross sectional sphere? It makes you take this to the other side. So let's say t was one half, I would take one minus t squared. So I would take t squared to the other side. This would become three quarters. Right. If t is zero, that's the equator, so you don't lose anything. <coughs> if t is close to one, you get close to the plus or minus one, you get close to the poles. And then you get smaller and smaller spheres. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So after the end, you would know that you can change the dimension in terms of either geometric or algebraic dimension. Right. And from one dimension, you can actually define the other dimension. Right. If you project, yeah, you can always take a projection from one dimension down, and you get an n dimensional thing. That's right. Yeah. So, it, right. So, in, in if you take an n, n plus one dimensional uh, space, if you take a ball and you cross section it, you get an n dimensional ball. That's right. Very good. Okay. Uh, right. So, so the questions to be answered were, uh, you know, what are the packings? The sort of miraculous. Answers in eight and twenty-four dimensions. So that's the first question. Um, <coughs> why did we jump? From three to eight to twenty-four. That's another question. And perhaps the largest the hardest question is how do you actually prove your answers? So how do you prove the answers in 8 and 24D? I mean, th from the way that I, I set this up, uh, from one dimension to two dimensions, you had a, almost an infinite complexity jump. And then from two dimensions to three dimensions, it was a pretty high complexity jump. You went from something you could write down in a couple of pages to something which required lots and lots of computer calculations. So you might imagine that this would uh, not be easy. But it turns out to be uh, sort of very very amazingly simple, uh, but requires a little bit of sophisticated tools. So I'm not going to, so in full disclosure, I'm not going to actually give you the proof, because that requires a little bit of extra uh, background. But I'm going to say a few words about, you know, about all these, all these questions. OK. Uh, any questions so far? All right. 
So let me go on to <coughs> let me say something about before I, I talk a little bit about the solutions. Uh, I want to say I want to talk a little bit about some variants of of the sphere packing problem, which are also quite interesting. So there's a local variant of the kissing pro of the sphere packing problem, which is called the kissing problem. So let me tell you what this is. So sphere packing, you ask, uh, you've got an infinite supply of equal size non-overlapping balls, and you want to pack space as densely as possible. And that requires considering all of space and infinitely many things. Uh, here we're just saying, take a central takes a central unit sphere. And how many can you arrange around it, which are all touching this one? How many balls can we arrange touching it, but not overlapping among themselves? So this is a problem that <coughs> is not too far in some sense. It's sort of a, you know, you're just looking at the neighborhood of one sphere and you're saying, what's the best possible job I can do around there? How many how many spheres can I cram in uh, without without overlapping? So again, let's let's look at some examples because that's the way to get any intuition about this. So <coughs> what happens in one dimension? So in one dimension, the balls are just intervals. So what's the best you can do? So you've got a central interval, and you want to put as many intervals around it, which are adjacent to it, because they're touching it, uh, but they're not overlapping. Anyone? Yes? Yeah, you can do exactly. Yeah, so you can put one on each side. Uh, One over here, and that's clearly the best you can do. So, so, this, so this number, the maximum possible number, is called the kissing number. So the kissing number in, in one dimension is two. Excellent. All right. So, so this was, and you clearly cannot do better. All right. Two dimensions. What's the best you can possibly do? Yep. Yeah. You want them to all to be the same size. That's right. And then, sorry. You, it's six, excellent. Okay, so and it comes again from the from the arrangement that the hexagonal arrangement. You can see that you're going to get six coins around one. And these all all touch the central coin. In fact, they also touch each other. So there's not much room for movement. This turns out to be the best you can do. Now, can somebody prove to me that this is the best that you can do? So let me give you a little hint. OK, oh, sorry, go ahead. Right, so they're all forced to be tangent to the central sphere, but I'm not forcing them to be tangent to each other. Uh, but right, but you're, you're on the right track. So all the spheres are tangent to the central one. Um, all, all the disks are tangent to the central one. And so if you look at, let's look at these three, okay? So if you look at these three sphere, these three disks, what you can say is that, well, this is tangent to this one. And so 
let us let us look at these two are not forced to be tangent to each other, but they are forced to be tangent to the central one. Okay, so what is this what is this distance? What is the distance from this? Yeah, it is going to be twice r, where r is the radius that I have chosen. Um, if I have chosen them to be unit radius, then that, that distance is 2. Okay? So this is 2, and this distance is also 2. And what can I say about this third distance? In this case, they happen to be two, but do they have to be exactly two or? In this case, it happens. Right, in this case, it happens to be equilateral triangle. But in general, if I had, if I had two coins which were touching a central coin, and they look like this, what what could I say about the distance between these? Sorry. Yeah, it, it's related to the angle. Uh, but what's what can I say that? Can I give a, an upper or lower bound on the distance? Yeah, it's, it must be at least two, right? Why is that? Right. So, <coughs> or in other words, I mean, if you go from here to here, you're going to pass these two. Yeah. The best you can do is when they when they touch each other. If it was less than two, they would be overlapping, right? So this this distance, whatever it is, it's at least two. Question? Can you hear it? Okay, so what does that tell me about this angle? So I have an angle, it's at least 60 degrees, right? So this is greater than or equal to 60 degrees. So, so each of these angles subtended by two consecutive coins around the central coin has to be at least 60 degrees. And therefore, right, so. 360 is 6 times 60, so you can cram in at most six of these guys. Um, okay, so, so each angle is less than equal to 60 degrees, so at most six. Great. So that's an actual proof uh, that took very little time. Okay. Um, so you see, you see, the kissing number problem is is a little easier than the sphere packing problem. The sphere packing problem would Took a couple of centuries to solve. Uh, okay, <coughs> right. <coughs> so this is two dimensions, um, but it's not completely trivial in every dimension. Two dimensions is kind of nice. You have this nice uh, hexagonal arrangement. Uh, let's go to three dimensions and see what happens there. So again, you have a central sphere, um, and you know by the same sort of token, you can transform this problem as saying the following. Um, you can think of it in two two ways. One is you're actually putting spheres around a central sphere. Another way is all you take the sphere of you take the sphere of radius two, or you can shrink that two to a one. It doesn't matter. Um, you just look at these points of tangency, or you look at the centers of the spheres, and they all lie on, on a sphere of radius 2. right? Or if you look at the points of tangency, they lie on a sphere of radius 1. Okay, So these are the centers. Let me look at the centers of the spheres, just to be concrete. And there are some points lying on the sphere. And you're saying the only constraint is they have to be separated by at least this angle, right? namely 60 degrees. So, so you want to, this question is, Equivalent. So, put points on the surface, in fact, of a sphere such that any angle that they subtended, subtended by any pair at the center is at least 60 degrees. And then the question you're asking. <coughs> is how many points can I put on the surface of the sphere? It's an equivalent problem, because if you give me a collection of points, I can make spheres with those centers, and, and it transforms to back to the kissing problem. OK? OK, so right. So in, in three dimensions, uh, are there any guesses for what might be the answer? Yeah? 
16. Why, why 16? Okay. Okay. You can put six. Yeah, I agree. Right. Uh, you mean in the so you would get. Oh, you mean uh, you want an extra layer on, on, on top after that? I see. Uh, so 16 is a little, it turns out to be a little too much. So what you can do is, yeah, so in fact, the layering tells you it's, you can put, uh, you can look at the, the face centered cubic arrangement that I wrote down. Uh, and I don't think I have it. It would be nice if I actually didn't erase it. But sadly, it looks like I have. Uh, so <laughs> So anyway, uh, here's here's what the arrangement looked like. So you s you've still got six around one in the s in the central layer, and then it turns out the next layer. Let me extend this a little bit. <coughs> well, let me. I don't actually need to extend it. Uh, the layer above, you actually get three, which are touching this the central one, and the layer below, you can get another three. Which are touching the central one. Ah, yes. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Right. So if you look at the poster, <laughs> you've got the six over here, and then you've got the three that are touching the central sphere. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and similarly, three downstairs. And the thing is, the next one actually doesn't touch the uh, the central one. So you can. It turns out the best you can actually do is six plus three plus three. Plus three. So, but. This is not easy at all to prove. Uh, so and in fact, it's not. In this case, things are unique. This is the six you can only do in one way, namely put, put them in this hexagonal arrangement. This is not unique, not unique, and not obvious. <laughs> um, so for one, for one thing, it's not unique because here's another example. So in this picture of putting points at, at, uh, on the surface of a sphere, think of the vertices of a regular icosahedron. Okay, so a icosahedron has 20 faces and 12 points, 12 vertices. So you've got 1 followed by 5, then 5, and then 1. And these are all the same distance from the center of gravity of the icosahedron. And, so, and there are 12 points. Uh, and they all turn out to be separated by at least 60 degrees. In fact, more than 60 degrees. So what happens is there's space for them to wiggle around. Uh, you can actually move those points. And so there's infinitely many ways of putting 12 points uh, around one, uh, 12 spheres around one central sphere. And in fact, uh, it's very interesting. You can, there's so much space that you can move them around, and you can make any permutation you want of the original locations. So you can sort of swap any two points and move them around, et cetera. You can move them continuously, right, exactly. So it's not unique. Uh, you can move points continuously around. So, it, so in fact, uh, this is again some famous problem. Uh, let me see if I have the, have the date. Uh, so this is called, <coughs> no, I don't have the date of this problem, but it was when Newton was around. So this is called the <laughs> Gregory-Newton problem. I don't remember. When exactly Newton was alive, but anyway, so this is called the Gregory Newton problem. So, and the problem, and the, or rather, the problem is a, is a, is a nice word for this. This is, is really a dispute. Okay, so, <laughs> so Gregory claimed, uh, since there was so much space and you could move things around, uh, Gregory claimed that you could add one more uh, point. He said it sh should be possible to put a 13th, cram in a 13th sphere around a central sphere. And Newton said, no, there's no way you can put one more. And uh, as it turns out, uh, with respect to academic disputes, Newton was correct, <laughs> uh, as usual. But it took uh, you know, a couple of centuries to prove that. This was only, so it wasn't proof. So, so Newton said 12, and Gregory said 13. And Newton is correct, but this was pro proved around 
1953. So this proof took a long time. Uh, it was a proof by Schutter and Van der Woorden. And I don't know if any of you have seen the, the book, uh, proofs from the book. Uh, so it's a famous like problem solving book where they collected, you know, very interesting proofs of, uh, you know, problems which seem very hard but had a very sort of slick solution. Um, uh, and a lot of it involves like Hungarian style combinatorics and so on. Uh, very interesting book. Um, so in the very first edition of this book, the very first chapter was was this proof. But then it turned out that this proof had, and they thought the proof was quite short, but it turned out to to fill in the proof you needed a lot of extra details, which basically disqualified it from the <laughs> from that book. So you know, it became too long to to fit in that uh, in that margin, so to speak. All right. So anyway, this is the point: is twelve is the best. Twelve is a kissing number in three dimensions, uh, but it's not so easy to prove. It requires requires some work. And uh, <coughs> right. Okay. So. So then you can ask for four dimensions. And here it turns out that the, the kissing number is 24. But this was only proved around, so. Two thousand three or so. Uh, this is a very recent result. So yeah, the answer in general, just like in the sphere packing problem, is not known in in, in general dimensions. There are only two more dimensions where it's known uh, beyond four, and guess which ones those are. Right, eight and twenty-four. Uh, <laughs> OK, so um, right. Uh, let me just say a, a little bit about uh, this one. This is also quite, a, quite an interesting problem. And uh, so this comes from, from the D4 lattice, which I'm going to define for you. Okay, I'm going to tell you some usual suspects in low dimensions. Um, it comes from the D4 lattice. Uh, so right now, I haven't given you any information uh, by saying D4 lattice. But, uh, but anyway, the, it's the points of the D4 lattice that are smallest uh, distance from the origin, uh, and 24 points are also they are the vertices of a regular polytope in four dimensions. So just like. Uh, I'd mentioned the the regular icosahedron, uh, which is the regular polytope in three dimensions, regular polyhedron. Uh, in general, you can talk about regular polytopes in n dimensions, and uh, they're actually pretty easy to enumerate. There's a couple of families of uh, regular polytopes, and and then there's you know a few sporadic examples. And this is kind of a magical example. Uh, this thing, this thing called the twenty-four cell. It's called the twenty-four cell. Okay, so it has has twenty four points, um, and uh, and, that, and it gives you the solution. It gives you a solution for for the kissing number problem in in four dimensions. Uh, so in fact, this problem is very interesting because what happens is there's a technique. So Give upper bounds for the kissing number problem. So it tells you that you cannot put in more than this number, where this number is something that you know this this technique is going to spit out. Okay, and on the other hand, you know you can make at least this many uh, by actually giving an example. So in, in, in four dimensions, it turns out that the that this technique tells you that the, there's an upper bound of 25. Okay, so <laughs> upper bounds, uh, and in 4D, um, it gives an upper bound of 25. 
5. So it's in some ways tantalizing, in some ways irritating, uh, because you know that you can cram in 24 points, namely here they are from the 24 cell. You know you cannot put in more than 25. So you, it's either 24 or 25. And which one is it? Uh, so anyway, this, so this, this was, you know, this is the kind of problem that you spend a lot of time thinking about. And I did, in fact, spend a lot of time thinking about this problem. Uh, so after I finished my undergrad, uh, I went to Microsoft Research, uh, the theory group there. Uh, and I worked with the mathematician there, Henry Cohn, who, who had been working on sphere packing problems. And so he got me hooked on this problem. Uh, and I spent, you know, I did an internship there for three months. And most of that internship, I spent thinking, thinking about this particular problem, how to prove that it's not 24, how to prove that it's not 25, but really 24. And uh, I tried lots of things. None of them worked. So at the end of the summer, we, the last two weeks, we decided to do something else. Uh, and then we came up with a, a nice proof that the Leach lattice was the densest lattice in, in eight dimensions. That took a little while to to iron out. But uh, anyway, the moral of the story is sometimes you you work on hard problems and you fail. Uh, and you know, you've got to take that in straight. Yep. Another good question. So in 3D, what happens is uh, there's a lower bound of 12, namely what you, you know, the ones that we wrote down, and there's an upper bound of 13. <laughs> So another sort of irritating thing. And that's so it's not enough to give you what you want. But uh, then you, if you do a lot of, if you throw in a lot of extra geometry and so on, some extra information, it, it turns out that you can convert that 13 to a 12. Uh, so in 2D, it's just, it's just 2D is exact. That's the, that's the miraculous thing. So in 2D, in 8D, and in 24D, the bound is sharp. It's, and so you don't have to worry. And so in fact, in it's sharp, the sharpness proves uniqueness also. So it tells you that nothing else could could be as good. Anyway, so right, so I spent most of my summer working on this, and then it turned out the next the next year, this was proved by so, kissing number four D. Twenty four. This was proved by Oleg Musen, a Russian mathematician, uh, in two thousand three. But uh, this is not known to be unique. Uh, not, not proven, I should say. Not proven to be unique. In other words, is there another arrangement of 24 points uh, that you know uh, around around a central point, apart from the one that comes from the D4 lattice or from the 24 cell? Uh, we expect the answer to be no. So we expect it to be unique, but it's not known. So it's kind of if you want to try, any of you want to give it a shot, here's a good problem to work on. <laughs> nice open problem. Right. But it wasn't unique in 3D, right? It was definitely not unique in 3D. But so why, would, why would we suspect it's unique in 4D? The four dimensional. So D4 is a much nicer lattice in some sense and sphere packing than, than, than the FCC thing. And in this case, so in the, in the, in the three-dimensional case, you can take the 12-point arrangement that comes from FCC or from the echocedron, and you can just straight easily deform it. And this one you cannot. It, it's, it's rigid, so you can't move it. Uh, Nobody has come up with another candidate. It's got to be rigid, though. Yeah, that, that you can show by. Um, by a computer program. I mean, you can write down something fairly straightforward, and, and you can show that you cannot deform it continuously. Yeah. So we expect that, that in fact, it's. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what used to be a nice open problem as a like, hard mess? Because maybe something that you just can't do as well? Yes, I think so. I mean, uh, you know, this is a, it, it's a, it's a hard, so one of the amazing things about sphere packing is, um, the questions that you can write down are very easy to understand and take you about an hour to figure out you know, what the problem is talking about and maybe look up some you know, references and so on. Uh, and the sort of set of techniques that, that have been applied is fairly small. Um, so you know, there are a few thi things that we try. And you know, like this uh, upper bound technique, 
that gives you an upper bound of, of uh, 25. Uh, and you can try to, try to improve upon that. So, so it's the kind of problem that's approachable, uh, that you know, doesn't require years of background studying about you know, algebraic geometry or you know, topology or things like that. It, it's easy to get your hands on, on this problem and try various things. And it's kind of fun to, to play around with these problems, which is basically what I, you know, I did once upon a time. Talk a little bit about like, the traditional professors of the problems and problems that <laughs> I haven't seen such an example, but, but that used to, I have heard that uh, there was a pro, you know, professor at MIT, uh, Giancarlo Rota, who, who would put um, you know, open problems on his problem sets sometimes, and, and you know, sometimes people, you know, students would solve them, uh, and, uh, and then he would tell them write a paper. Uh, so it was kind of fun. Uh, so it happens sometimes. I think people put very hard problems on, uh, you know, just give them to. It's sometimes easy to. It's sometimes better not to know what's been done on a problem, and that people have tried hard uh, and and failed, because it gives you a sort of, you know. It gives you a fresh perspective, and you don't know that the problem is hard, so you you try everything, and you might see something that other people haven't, uh, and that's kind of, you know, part of the fun of math. I mean. Uh, you don't need you don't need a you know a million dollar lab to run experiments and and you know you don't need a team of you know 50 people working with you to, to be able to, to get into you know to really get your hands on a hard problem you can just jump into it uh, read up what's known before which in some cases doesn't take very long and and you can try your hand at you know, some very interesting problems so it's almost dynamic to not have yeah i think so <laughs> Yeah, that's why kids should try more. Yeah. Young people should try more problems, I think. More hard, open problems. In some sense, I, this is a, the fact that I've told you it's an open problem is perhaps, <laughs> perhaps a bad thing. But anyhow. Um, right, so the other thing that I mentioned was that apart from these dimensions, the only other answers that are known for the kissing problem uh, are known in, in 1824. Kissing numbers are 240, and this comes from the E8 lattice, which again I'm, I'm going to define for you. And 196560, this comes from the EH lattice. John Leach was a British mathematician who um, studied number theory and many other things, and the Leach lattice is named after him. <coughs> Right. So, uh, and and the, the the amazing thing that happens that allows you to prove this is that the sort of uh, the upper bound technique which is called linear programming bounds Gives a sharp bound matched by <coughs> the sort of the, by the lower bound, which comes from the from the, the picture itself, from the geometry itself, so ma matches the lower bound from from the corresponding. Uh, from one of these two configurations. So you know that you can produce 240 points, and the linear programming upper bound says it's 240 exactly. There's an upper bound of this many points. And so you know you cannot do any better. That's the best you can do. Just like in, in the two-dimensional case, there's an upper bound that's produced at 6, and you know that you can produce 6. So, And uh, a, a slight bit of work allows you to show that that's the only way you could do it. All right, any questions so far? Okay, so uh, let me see. So I want to tell you, so this was one variation, and it's kind of a fun variation to play with um, of sphere packing, uh, namely the kissing number problem. I'm going to talk about a little, another way in which you can make the kissing number problem, uh, the sphere packing problem uh, more sort of approachable and, and perhaps easier to solve. And so, and that's by, only considering regular arrangements. 
And these regular arrangements are called lattices. So I'm going to talk about lattices. Okay. <coughs> right. So so very informally a lattice is a regular collection of points in space. Okay, so let me make that more precise now. So more formally. So what you do is in n dimensional space you choose n points. Okay, so choose n points and then you can take the sums and differences of these points okay so can take sums and differences of these and then take sums and differences of those and you keep going okay uh, sums and differences of the resulting collection which is larger keep going okay uh, and so what you when you do this iterated sums and differences procedure uh, you end up with what are called linear combinations of all these points so so you get get all linear combinations Of these endpoints. Okay, so in, in so you start in say five dimensional space, you take exactly five points and you take sums and differences and so on and you keep going. So let me give you an example. Uh, And what do I mean by sums and differences? So I want to think of a point as being a vector, um, right? So I want to think of it as being a collection of coordinates. And when you take a sum, you add the coordinates. And you take difference, you, you subtract the coordinates. So this is, you, you add and subtract like vectors. Does everybody, have people seen vectors before? This might be a little confusing. All right, let, let, me, let me give you an example. So, so for example, in two dimensions, Say you start with two points, and I'm going to choose the points 1, 0, and 0, 1. Okay, so on the x and y axes, I've just chosen the points at, at unit distance. Okay, this is 1, 0, this is 0, 1. Okay, and then I'm going to take sums and combinations sums and differences of these these guys and so right so if i add these uh, i just get what what do, what do i get when i add these two points i add these two vectors um, and more algebraically i'm just saying i'm going to add 1 0 0 1 i'm going to add the corresponding coordinates so 1 plus 0 gives me 1 plus 1 gives me 1 and geometrically this is the parallelogram law so uh, you make the parallelogram which has these sides and you end up with 1 comma 1 okay so that's the point that you get is this, is this okay <coughs> we're following this okay and then if you subtract for instance so if you take 1 0 minus 0 1 you again you subtract each coordinate so 1 minus 0 gives you 1 and then 0 minus 1 gives you minus 1 and what what happens is that you take the vector which starts at the end of this one and, and ends at the end of this one. So it gives you this. So you can translate it to the origin and it gives you this vector. And this is 1 comma minus 1. Okay? So, so it gives you this point. And then you keep doing this uh, and you end up with what do you end up with? Yep. Ah, sorry. Good point. Right. Ah, I subtracted this one from this one so it's going this way good point right so it should be this it should be this vector which is one comma minus one thank you right so if i keep doing this to the new collection and so on what do i end up with 
yeah, you get the you get the entire square lattice if you keep doing this, uh, and that's and that's what I mean by so in in general what you end up with is the set of all linear combinations, m times one zero plus n times zero one, where m and n are some integers. In other words, you get m comma n. Multiply this out, m times this. You just multiply into each coordinate, so you get n comma zero plus zero comma n, which is m comma n. So you get all the integer points, namely the the regular sort of grid in two dimensions. And in, this is in general what you do. And if I started with two other points in two dimensions, I would get a different lattice. Uh, and this is what I mean by a lattice in general. I'll go over here. So in general, set of the set of all linear combinations, integer linear combinations of n vectors or n points gives you a lattice. Except when it doesn't. Okay, so there's a little bit of a lie here. Okay, <laughs> uh, provided a couple of conditions. One condition is that you should never repeat. So, what ha one condition is that you should never be able to end up at zero when you when you take a linear combination of these things. So, for example, if I took uh, the two points, one comma zero. So let me write this as counter examples. Okay, these are the bad cases you need to avoid. Okay. So if you take one comma zero and minus one comma zero, right? So if you take two points in two dimensions which both lie along the x-axis, and you just take the linear combination of these, then uh, that's no good. Okay. So this is bad because what what happens if you do this? You get a 1D yeah, you can just get a 1D lattice because uh, the sum of these two these are linearly dependent. There's some linear combination that becomes zero, and so that that's not what you want. Um, anyway, so these are the kinds of things, and you also want them to be not too close together, uh, so they might not. Here's another sort of bad example. Um, you might not have a linear combination that actually becomes zero. Uh, for instance, if you take 1 comma 0 and pi comma 0, what happens? Yeah, you don't get, so what you get is an infinite collection of points. No linear combination of 1 comma 0 and pi comma 0 is going to be 0 comma 0 because pi is irrational. But you can get arbitrarily close to the origin. You don't want that. So this is the kind of thing that you need to avoid. Uh, so I'm not going to sort of formally write down what what that does, but it's it's not too hard to do it. Okay, so let me just say most of the time you write you take endpoints, you take their span, uh, namely all the lin integer linear combinations, you get a lattice. So and that's a regular arrangement. Things are sort of placed nicely, uh, and it's a repeating arrangement. There's like a parallelogram which repeats and so on. <coughs> all right, so so these are so that's what I mean by a lattice. And uh, let's see some examples of some familiar lattices, some nice ones. Okay, so. so we saw that in, in two dimensions, if you took 1, 0, and 0, 1, you get the square lattice. And it, more generally, if you take 1, 0, 0, dot, 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 0, 1, 0, dot, dot, dot. All the unit coordinate vectors, 0, 0, 1, dot, dot, dot et cetera, to 0, 0, 1. Uh, <coughs> and if you take all the integer linear combinations, what do you end up with? Yeah, you get the regular grid in n dimensions. So, so this gives you 
grid which is called z to the n in dimensions. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of a, of a lattice. <coughs> okay, so this is a, called the integer lattice. Okay, uh, another example is if I take the following one, following points. I take two zero 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 zero, and then I take one comma one comma zero zero comma one one and zero zero zero. Etc. Okay, so these are endpoints in, in n dimensions. What would I get? Which two would you subtract? Uh, let's say the second and the third. Uh -huh. Oh no, I see right. So you get one and minus one. one, minus one yeah. Right. What's something that's preserved? So you, whenever you subtract, you always end up with integer coordinates. So whatever this is, it's a sub, it's a sub lattice of of this thing, right? It's a subset of that. But what special thing does it? You don't get all zeros, right? Right. That's true. But but what else can can I say that's special about this? That's preserved when I take sums and differences. <laughs> so what's the parity of each row? Right, the sum of the digits is always two, and and if you subtract or add, it's always going to be remain. It's always going to remain even, not not necessarily two, but maybe four or zero or six or so on. But it's going to remain even. So, right. So this is what's called the. So this gives you gives what's called the checkerboard lattice. That is, and that's called Dn in dimensions. And what it is is it's all the points, all the integer points, which have even coordinate sum. You get everything of that form. Anything that has some coordinates being even, you're going to get. So this is the checkerboard lattice because on a checkerboard, you can divide into you know black and white. So two. Uh, subsets which are separated by one shift and you take all the even ones all the white ones or the black or the black or the black depending on how you colored it um, and you get you get that sub lattice of index 2 it's a, it's a half of of the original lattice so in, in general this is what's going to give you that okay so in two dimensions right so you can you would get 2 0 and 1 1 but what happens is um, it's a good point. So in 2D, if you write down the checkerboard, you got 2, 0, here's 1, and then 1, 1 is here. And when you subtract, you can get, when you take linear combinations, what you get is all these points, and it just forms a, a rotated by 45 degree copy and scale of the original grid. Does that make sense? If you subtract this, you get this, this thing at 45 degrees, then when you subtract the other way, you get this thing at 45 degrees, and, and you can keep going. And so in the end, you end up with something that's equivalent. I mean, in, it's not it's half of the original thing, but it's just it's, it's an actual you know, it's, it's just rotated and shifted, uh, scaled. And gives you something that's isomorphic as a lattice in some sense. But it's in four dimensions, it's not going to be just. In four dimensions, it's not. That, that, yeah, good point. Right. So in, in in four dimensions or even in three dimensions, it, it gives you something that's distinct from, from the standard grid. Uh, and in four dimensions, it gives you D4. And that's the thing that you know, uh, we suspect is the densest packing in four dimensions, but we don't know. Uh, and, certainly, and it gives you the densest, uh, it gives you the answer to the kissing number, and that we do know. I mean, we can prove that. Um, so uh, let me see. I mean, let me do an ex yeah, let me do a an example is kind of fun to calculate. Uh, since we talked about D4, let me see if we can. 
So by that definition, let's see if we can enumerate all the smallest points in D4. So, okay, so D4 A, B is a set of all points A, B, C, D such that uh, A plus B, so A, B, C, D are in are all integers and A plus B plus C plus D is even. Okay, so so zero 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 isn't there. And what are the sort of smallest vectors in here? Uh, that's what I want to know. So what are the smallest vectors? Or in other words, the points which are closest to the origin. Yes? OK. Right. So you can't have 1, 0, 0, 0. You can't just have a single 1, because its coordinate sum is not even. But you can have 1, 1, 0, 0, because I even wrote it down. And by definition, it has a 0 coordinate sum. So that's there. Um, what else? Right, 2, 0, 0, 0 is there. Uh, but what's the, let's compare the, the length of this vector to the length of this vector. Right, so here you get square root of 2. Here you get square root of 4, namely 2. So this is longer, so we're going to throw out these ones. These are not the shortest. We're only considering all the things which are closest to the origin. So we only want things which are uh, at a distance square root of 2, which is the smallest that you could have. So what other things could be in here? You can have two ones and two zeros. Uh, anything else? Yep. You could have negative ones, right? So you could have minus one, minus one. Could you also have a one and a minus one? Right? So the sum is coordinate sum would be zero. So so in fact I can have plus minus one, plus minus one. And I can have them in any two positions. Right? So how many of these are there? Right. So four here and then four choose two. For where do you want to put the ones times four? So this is six. So it gives you twenty-four. These are the vertices of the twenty-four cell. Okay. So that's kind of how you get the, the kissing number in, in four dimensions. Okay. So let me at least define E eight. So all right, so you take so this is, it's actually very easy to define E8. Uh, you take D8, uh, namely all the eight-dimensional integer vectors which have even coordinate sum, and you add this one in, and you throw in this one. The all halves vector. Okay, so eight of these. Okay, and here the coordinate sum is again four, so you're okay. And um, so anyway, th these, all these things plus this one extra vector, if you take all the linear combinations with this vector, you get a lattice that's, that's twice as dense as V8, and that's, that's V8. And this gives you, gives you okay, so a fun calculation, since we like fun calculations, let's do one more. All right, so how many, how many smallest vectors does E8 have. So to start with, what's the what's the smallest vector length for D8? What are the smallest vectors in D8? So it's root two again. Again, yeah. So the smallest length you can get is root two because you can have two two ones and six zeros, right? So so you get again plus minus one plus minus one, six zeros. And how many of these are there? Right, we're going to get to that in a second. But how many of these types are there? Right. So it's 28 times 4, so that's 112. So good. And the reason why we chose this vector, it's rigged to have the same length as, as any of these, namely, one quarter plus one, if you take one quarter, add eight of them, you get two. And so the, the length of that vector is square root of two, the same as these. So in fact, you get one half, one half dots. So this is at least one extra vector that you can throw in. But what else could, could we get from here? Yeah, in fact, you get 
you get all the signs except you don't get all the signs because you can only shift it by two coordinates at, at one point. So what you can do is you get all, so with, with an even number of minus signs. So you get all these vectors. So so the number of these is 2 to the 8, but you have to divide by 2 because you can't get all of them. So add them up to 40. So that gives you the, the kissing number in, in eight dimensions. All right. Uh, any questions about E8? So E8 is pretty straightforward to define. Um, Let me define, while we're here, two other lattices which are related to E8, uh, which are very interesting in six and seven dimensions, um, which are E6 and E7. So, so E7, how do you make E7? I'm going to do something slightly different than throw in a vector. I'm going to take out a vector in some sense. So you take, a start from E8, and take all the vectors so take a, let me just say, take any take any smallest vector, any smallest vector, namely, so for example, you could take all the all halves vector, okay, and you take all the things which are orthogonal to this, so and take the orthogonal complement. If this vector is v, you take the orthogonal complement of v. So namely, take all, all w in E8 such that v dot w <laughs> is 0. Okay, so what that does is it reduces the dimension by 1. And what you end up with is, so, you end, so the resulting lattice is E7. And uh, similarly, you can make E6 by taking orthogonal complement of two vectors. Let's say you could take 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 1, 0. So these two span a hexagonal lattice in two dimensions. And if you take the orthogonal complement, you get something in six dimensions, and that's E6. Uh, now, the reason I, I mentioned E6 and e, E7 is at least now I can tell you what the answers for the densest lattices are in all dimensions up to 8. So you can ask for the densest lattices in any dimension. What does that mean? It means if you take a lat, your spheres are restricted to lie on the, their centers must be on the on the points of the lattice. Okay, so it's a regular arrangement of spheres in that sense. And if you restrict to that, the problem becomes a little easier, although not completely easy. Um, and so that that problem, which is an easier problem, is called the lattice packing problem. And you can ask for the densest lattice in any dimension. And here we know the answers up to dimension eight. Densest lattice. Let me down. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So all right. So here it's it's basically one lattice in one dimension. That's Z. So there's not much to do. Here is the hexagonal lattice. Here is the FCC. Then in four and five dimensions you get D four and D five. In six, seven, eight you get E six, E seven. So, so the, and, and these answers were given by, so in the first three dimensions, it was already known to, to Gauss. This was proved, four and five were proved by two Russian mathematicians, Korkin and Zorotarev. And six, seven, and eight were proved by Blickfeld in around 1930s. And then we know one more dimension, 24 dimensions, the Lynch lattice. And this was Henry Cohn and myself 
Um, this was around 2005. So <coughs> let me publish it. Okay. Uh, so I've defined most of the usual suspects. So, and by the way, incidentally, these are our guesses for the densest backings in, in these dimensions, uh, except we can't prove most of them. Uh, so we cannot prove at this point four, five, six, and seven. Uh, we can only prove eight because of sort of the breakthrough last year, uh, and 24, again, because of the follow-up uh, result that we had. Okay. Let me end by just saying uh, So let me say one thing. I haven't defined for you what the leech lattice is. I don't think I will, uh, unless people really want me to. It, it takes a, a few minutes to define it. Uh, in fact, there are lots of constructions known of the, the leech lattice, but they're all sort of slightly involved. So I'm not going to try and go there. But let me just mention how you, how you actually prove these things. So, right. um, so what, what you get, so just like in, in, in the kissing number problem, there is a there's a technique, which is linear programming bounds for sphere packing. And uh, <coughs> these were proved by Henry Cohn in his thesis with, with no Melkies. Uh, this was around 2000 or so. And these give you, give you upper bounds. You get lower bounds where actually exhibiting the lattices or, or sphere packings. Uh, and if they match exactly, then, then you're done. Uh, and what happens is in eight, eight dimensions, in two dimensions, eight dimensions, two dimensions, we already know the answer, so it's less of a concern. But in, in, in these three dimensions, the lower bounds are, well, initially, you notice that they're awfully close. They're very close to upper bounds. Right, so you can produce upper bounds by exhibiting particular functions for linear programming, which are, which give you upper bounds which are extremely close to the density for, for Leach and, and and the E8 lattice, and and then you say, okay, this can't be a coincidence. They match up to you know 30 digits of precision, so it must be, it must be the right answer. There must be a sharp bound. So, so conjecture was, there exists a sharp bound. But how do you actually find? A sharp bound. Uh, this was the breakthrough that Vyazovska had. So it produced what we called the magic functions for the linear programming bound by using theory of modular forms. So what, what ended up happening is that she took a uh, a modular form, which is a very interesting object in number theory. It has lots of symmetries. And modular forms show up all, all over the place in number theory. They're used in, for instance, uh, Andrew Wiles's proof of, of Fermat's last theorem. Uh, and they're a central object in, in, in modern uh, number theory. So she took some of these things, and she applied essentially a Laplace transform uh, to such a modular form. And it gives you uh, well, Laplace transform is some is a transformation of, of these functions into a sort of a different domain. And it gives you the kind of function that you then plug into a linear programming bound. And it turns out to, to give you a sharp bound, which is kind of an amazing thing. Uh, and then, so she did this for, right, to produce a ma magic function by using modular forms. So this is in eight dimensions. And then we, then we followed up and finished the proof in, in 24 dimensions also. Um, and it's kind of an amazing insight that, uh, that she had, uh, and it's the kind of thing that you know, you could ponder this question for <laughs> for years and and sort of not look at it the right way. And she happened, you know, she was looking at it at you know a sort of new, brilliant, and very novel way. And and she found this. You know, she happened to be um, also in the right place at the right time. She had a background in, in sort of number theory, in modern number theory, and and she found these these amazing objects, which related to which she could apply to then to the sphere packing, and, and so that's, that's part of the breakthrough, which I'm not you know, in detail going to describe. But um, I'll just, there are some, uh, I'll just point you to some sort of 
expository, uh, there are at least a couple of expository papers uh, about, about this work. Um, and there's also an article in, in Quantum Magazine, which you can read if you're interested uh, about this breakthrough. OK, so maybe I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Any questions? Yep. Yeah, uh, uh, So uh, you want a lattice in seven dimensions. So that's and and one way to do that is to take you know take everything that's orthogonal to one particular lattice. So for instance, if you you started from the square lattice and you took everything that's orthogonal to the vector zero one, you would just get the integer lattice. So it cuts down the dimension by one. And in this case, it doesn't matter which vector you take the orthogonal complement. There's enough symmetry to see that to show that you know once you take the orthogonal complement, all of those lattices, no matter which vector you started out out with, would give you the same. It would give you the same E7. And uh, would we have to do that for any other you can make, I mean, this kind of question, you know, you can take any lattice and you can take any um, vector in it and take this orthogonal complement and give you some lattice, but it might not be a very interesting lattice. Yeah. I mean, in this case, it happens to be a nice construction of a, of a quite an interesting lattice. These things also show up in, in Lie theory and, and all over the place in math. Any other questions? Oh, is that it? Oh, yeah. So Henry's right. The, uh, one of the expository articles is by is by Henry Cohn, and he wrote an expository article in the Notice of the AMS, which describes some of this. Right. So that's again another reference. Right. And it has to be it won. Yeah. yeah. This is an. Uh, it's a big result. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Vyazovska Marina, Marina herself has won several very good, uh, you know, very important awards for for her work. Yep. It's not really, yeah. This is not a part of <laughs> part of my part of my uh, you know work work. This is something that um, you know I, I, I do math on the side as, as a hobby. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Other questions? Yep. Oh, to 12 points. Uh, I'm curious what, what oh. shape you get. Like, you get a 24 dimensional manifold? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I suppose so, yeah. I think in that case, you do get it. And it uh, well, in three dimensions, because you have 12 yeah, points, you get a 12 dimension. Two 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 oh, dimensions, yeah. Right? Yeah, I suppose, yeah, that would be a, a 24 dimensional but object. Don't know what shape it is or I think. It's yeah, I'm not sure. People might, may have done some some studies on on that, but I haven't seen them. Yeah, but certainly they must have done something to see that you can permute them, permute these things around. Uh, I think the book of con the the I fact where could be interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in general, people study configuration spaces for uh, points on 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 a sphere, for n points on a sphere, and you want to, you know, you can study a configuration space of points which are separated up by at least some distance, and that's some code of some some angle. And uh, that could have some interesting topology. So people do study those things, uh, yeah. but how much is known about them? That's a <laughs> that's a different question. Yeah. Yep. It's a good channel, I would say, yeah. Right. So what do you think? I mean, I have certainly met, you know, mathematicians who are of the highest caliber who have, you know, who are not fast mathematicians, who don't, you know, do like quick problem solving and would do terribly on the Putnam exam and so on, uh, but are, you know, amazingly deep and strong mathematicians. And so it's a slightly different set of skills in general. Um, that said, I think, you know, the fact that people like doing these uh, contest problems and so on, or 
um, that seems to be a good you know a good preparation in some sense to to sort of talk to other people about you know uh, a see the kind of problems that are showing up some a lot of these contest problems the people who write them they are sort of inspired by uh, problems that show up in their research and so on so it's not it's not completely divorced from research mathematics um, the skill set is slightly different but uh, and certainly you have lots of people who do contest math and then you know they go off and do something else in life and don't become research mathematicians that that can also happen um, so you know it's but there's su you know substantial overlap so all in all i am you know for things that you know for things that help uh, you know popularize math to to kids and and to get them interested and you know that there may be various channels to do that uh, but certainly, math contest is, is is a good way to do it. Yeah. So, so there are some. Yeah. So there are some programs which are you know not necessarily geared towards contest math, uh, like Ross and Promise, and Math Circle and so on, which are more you know uh, help people discover math in a different way and to sort of look at more research type questions. Um, you know, the, the goal is. How do you discover math rather than how do you solve a problem in a, in you know in half an hour or something like that? And so I think there are many more ways to to get into math. Uh, it's just that at this point of time, you know, some are more well known and sort of more well publicized. But but I think certainly that you know the the number of options available for kids is is growing and and uh, is already quite enormous. So that's good. For what? Yeah, I'm right, right, absolutely. I mean, I think you know, uh, problem solving, whether it's you know, fast problems or or research type problems or you know, open ended problems. I think uh, it's it's a good way to get people in, in, in into you know research in general. I think uh, or you know to to get that uh, sort of. Um, Analytical those analytical skills which can which can help them in in not just in math but also in you know computer programming or finance or re, you know uh, what have you, so uh, it's definitely a good start for uh, for young kids. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. What got me interested in mathematics? Uh, well, I mean, I I was. So my dad is an engineer by training, a mechanical engineer, and he had all these math books lying around in, in some uh, you know in some cupboard. And so I basically, when I was a kid, I would sort of go and find them and, and try to read them. And he taught me a little bit of you know calculus and and so on uh, algebra early on. So so that that definitely got me interested. Once I once I picked up, I, I didn't sort of you know I, I really liked it. So uh, I was very interested in you know math and physics and so on as a kid. So that's. I didn't really contemplate doing, you know, mathematics uh, research until I maybe I, I went to the the math Olympiad camps in India, and that really got me. You know, I saw there were all these other people who were interested in doing this stuff, and so I think that that sense of community certainly is is helpful for you know, getting you interested in theoretical math and as a profession. Not always, no, no. And there, like there were several classes where I think you know you don't really get understand it until you you know after you've taken it, and then you know you have to sort of let it sit and process for a while. So I don't think it's a uniform mode of, but uh, yeah. Um, hmm, that's a good question. Uh, no, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I wanted to do number theory, and uh, I could have gone to a 
few other places. Um, you know, Harvard just seemed to be like the best fit for me at that point of time, um, and yeah, I don't regret going to Harvard. It was quite nice. You know, it was an amazing environment. So. Oh, I know, no, I took the entrance exam. I didn't actually go to IIT. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, I think, you know, my parents were very happy with my decision. They, you know, they knew about MIT, and so they were very happy to see me go. I mean, of course, they were not happy that I was going far away, but, you know, <laughs> pros and cons. <laughs> For this kind of thing, I'm not, mm -hmm. okay. Oh, in general, I mean, I think, uh, you know, various parts of finance use, you know, various uh, interesting mathematics. Uh, you know, you can use, you know, the, certainly a lot of finance uses probability and statistics. Um, you know, linear algebra is a given. Uh, people use, you know, all kinds of algorithms. Um, there's a lot more applied math kind of flavor thrown in because you're tr trying to model various behavior in the stock market, real, real world, and so um, it's a slightly different flavor than, than theoretical math, where you're sort of looking for one particular answer and you know it exists and you just can't find it, whereas in applied math you sort of, you know, have to build some set of assumptions and you have to sort of, you know, uh, it will you know it will approximate the real world, it is not necessarily going to be exact. So it's a little different kind of thinking, uh, but certainly like lots of high-powered math gets used um, all, over the all over the place in finance too, um, certainly things like, you know, combinatorics probability and so on. Yeah. 